It's good to be able to come in and worship God together, isn't it? Amen. These times uh, that we live in are very troubled, it appears, by our, what's going on in our world. And I know for some of you, there's been, uh, over the last little while, there's, there's been loss, and, and we want to stand together with the McDonald family and continue to pray for them during this time. And uh, just want them to know that there's a church that is going to be standing with them and together with them. And uh, I'm just thankful so very much for all of you and your faithfulness. Amen. It's good to be a child of God, isn't it? Amen. I was uh, holding Georgia there at the beginning and uh, noticed that she was uh, copying me by lifting her hands. I thought that was kind of cute. She'd look at me and... Uh, and then, uh, I don't know what's going on with my phone, but she'd look at me and then she'd lift her hand and then she'd look around at all of you and she'd lift both hands. And, and then towards the end in the last song, she was trying to cover her ears. I think that might have been my singing that was doing that, but uh, it's just uh, so good to have the kids in with us, isn't it? Amen. I've got a, uh, a message that's been kind of on the back burner for quite some time now that I want to preach to you about today and uh, just want God to be able to affirm some things. I know on Tuesday nights uh, we're going through some fundamental doctrines and we're going to be doing some some more in-depth of study of that over the next coming weeks and uh, I'm thankful that the Bible is true and that it's backed up and and uh, just give me half a sec here will you? I'm not sure what is going on here. Oh, that's better. Alrighty, um, but uh, but the Bible is true, and uh, we can go back and we can assure ourselves and by the things that are written that God inspired in the men that wrote it, and uh, that we can uh, know exactly what we believe and why we believe it. And uh, we don't need to be drawn away by fables or other people's opinions or thoughts, because the Bible is very clear as far as our salvation, as far as how we should live our lives. And uh, I'm really thankful for that. I don't always live up to it, just so you know. There's sometimes I get aggravated. Not with any of you, of course. <laughs> uh, but there's sometimes my patience is not what it should be and, and all of that. And, and sometimes I struggle with uh, mostly just myself as opposed to all of you because all of you are so good and perfect and wonderful good looking no okay alrighty if you want to get your Bibles uh, the next two messages the one today and the one next Sunday I've actually got a two part on this and we're going to talk about the authority and the power and uh, today we're going to preach on the authority of the name is the title of my message but if you want to headline that at the beginning if you're taking notes uh, that it is going to be a two part and it's going to be a th the authority and the power and uh, so we're going to be dealing with the authority of the name of Jesus today. Acts chapter 3, we're going to read uh, uh, probably a little bit more than we usually do, but uh, it's always good to go to Scripture, and I, I just uh, think it's a great thing to read Scripture. Acts chapter 3, 1 through 8, we're going to read, and then we're going to drop down. could have read it all, but we're going to drop down to uh, 14 through 16. Then we're going to go over to chapter 4 and verses 7 through 12 in the book of Acts. And uh, I... It's so important to me as a pastor that, that we understand what it is that we believe. I think a lot of times we, we get some things that are passed on to us and, and we hear it so often and sometimes we, we tend to just accept things and uh, without really taking a good hard look at them to find out what does the Bible say in regards to some of these things. And uh, we're doing some of this on Tuesday night. We talked about belief this um, not this last Tuesday, I wasn't here, but the Tuesday before, and what all that actually means from the original Greek word. And uh, it's so important that we do go back to understand because uh, the Greek words are sometimes a whole lot different than the way the translations are. I think the translators tried their best, uh, but sometimes you'd need to get about four or five different translations and kind of combine it together and maybe go back in a Young's Concordance, Strong's Concordance and and find out. Unfortunately, none of us here knew, know Hebrew or Greek, I'm assuming, right? No? Okay. 
Alrighty, so we've got to trust the uh, information that is given to us, but it's really good for us to be able to go back and take a look at that. So Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I don't want to tire you guys out by keeping you standing too long. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple... Uh, he asked to receive alms of them, I'm assuming that was his habit when he heard and saw people, because it didn't often, by his stance, sometimes he wasn't even looking, he was just looking down. And uh, so he'd recognize or instinctively or hear somebody walking by, and, and he would immediately maybe lift his cup, but at the very least he would call out to them and ask for alms, ask that they would give to him. And uh, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. So obviously he wasn't looking at them, even though he was asking for something from them. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. Well, what I do have, I give to you. Now, I want you to take note of this because this is going to be part of the conversation during the next little while in the book of Acts. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. If you want to drop, oh, I've got one more verse, don't I? Uh, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Obviously not the the highest sense of decorum for the tabernacle, right? He's running and leaping and praising God. So, as, you know, Pentecostals, we can, we can feel, you know, pretty good because this started way back at the beginning of the book of Acts that this is the way that this man went into the tabernacle. And <coughs> if you want to drop down with me to uh, verse 14, if you would, please. Um, Peter started preaching to those that were there and, and we're catching the kind of the middle of his message here. But you denied the Holy One and Righteous One, Holy and Righteous One, talking about Jesus, obviously, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man, this perfect health in the presence of you all. And if you want to drop down to chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 through 12. Now, just a little bit of uh, information before we read that is that Peter and John have now been brought before the Sanhedrin Council uh, to, uh, to answer some questions in regards to this individual that is running and leaping in the tabernacle. And uh, so if you want to start with me in verse 7. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired. Now look at the question. By what power or by what name did you do this? Just by way of information, that word power is, is interpreted by what authority. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, and by what means this man has been healed... Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that, and again, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you whole or well. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other, and everybody say name, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must. Everybody say must. Everybody say it again with some feeling. Must. We must be saved. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we love you so very much. I thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of just being your child and being able to come and worship you today. Thank you, Lord, that... Uh, when we come, we know that you will meet with us. We know that you're going to do a work in our lives. Father, I just pray today that each one of us will get some affirmation within our lives and our souls 
regarding the power and authority that is there in your name and that is available to each and every one of us. Pray for those that may be watching online. I pray that you will just, Lord, across the airwaves, whatever media they're using, that you will just touch each one, speak to each one. Thank you for each one that is, uh, is watching or joining together with us in the sanctuary by that media. And Father, I just pray that your word will go forth with power, with authority, and Father, that it will be received by each and every one who is within the hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated as soon as you tell your neighbor how good they look today. Ah, some of you sat down before you... All righty. Everybody good? It's good to see all of you. It's... Uh, Again, it's uh, so good to be able to be in the uh, house of God today and be able to worship. Uh, just had a, my wife and I, of course, were away for Thanksgiving up in Kelowna and just had a great dinner with Nathan and Trina. We brought another one of my grandchildren down with me. who was with uh, her other grandma. But uh, just uh, thank God for his protection. We had some snow going across the connector and it was kind of icy and a little miserable going across there. But uh, but God was with us, and I'm so thankful for that. In, the, uh, in Bible times, um, there was, and it was actually before Bible times and, and probably after, at least the time of Jesus, there was uh, this way of doing things that if there was a king in the land, that uh, obviously he couldn't be everywhere at the same time. And so what the king would do, he would find somebody, an emissary or, or a messenger, and, and what he would do is he would give that individual the authority to be able to use his name. Now, oftentimes, these designated emissaries and messengers, um, along with that authority, they were given a letter that would just clarify for those that had any questions regarding whether or not this man was justified in being able to use the king's name and the king's authority, he would have a letter that, would, uh, that they'd be able to read and take a look at it, and it would say this individual, whatever his name would be, is now given the authority to use the king's name in any transaction, any dealings, and every subject, every citizen of that country would then have to be subject to that individual that was the messenger or emissary of the king. Oftentimes the letter was, uh, was accompanied, or I would say the most times it was accompanied, not only with the king's letter, but also with the king's seal. So that seal would be placed upon the letter, and, and when that seal was placed upon the letter, the reason for that is that, that people wouldn't be able to counterfeit it. They wouldn't be able to just write a letter and say, well, in the name of the king, I'm telling you that you've got to give me your horse because I need it. I imagine just like, just like in this day and age, there probably were a lot of people trying to defraud other people. And so they wanted to make sure that, that whoever used this authority and whoever went into the land and tried to uh, acquire things from people or get their, get their uh, service for a certain period of time was justified in being able to do so. And we'll talk a little bit more about that seal in our lives uh, next Sunday. But uh, just that seal was the justification. That seal was the king's signet ring that he would put wax or whatever he used on the letter and then he would imprint it with a ring that was specifically and uniquely his and so in so doing, those that saw it would say, hey, that's the king's seal. That man has the authority now to use the name of the king in, in whatever dealings that he was de going to be uh, doing on the, uh, on the command of the king. We find in the word of God that, that Jesus claimed to have that authority. Fact is, uh, in Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, just prior to Jesus' ascension, uh, he said these words, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, initially, when we look at the word power in that passage of scripture, we're thinking strength, we're thinking maybe the same power that it talks about the beginning of the book of Acts, where it says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Two different words. They're not even the same word. They're not even related to the same word. But in the English, they're translated both to mean the word power. This, this word power in Matthew literally means that Jesus is saying that I have, and if you look at your, uh, your Amplified Bible and some other translations, they'll translate it properly. He's saying that I, all authority has been given unto me both in heaven and in earth. 
Now, literally, it's talking about like a, a commander-in-chief has received all the authority to be able to command those that are under him. And so when Jesus is talking about all power is given unto me, he literally is saying that I have the authority now to command all of those that are under me to do exactly what I want them to do. I have that authority. Now, it's interesting to note that that uh, Jesus doesn't generally come into our lives and say, you've got to do this or else. Generally, he comes into our lives and, and makes suggestions or he tells us via the word what we should be doing. And then it's up to us to make a choice. The, in, the, in the Bible times, the, if they didn't obey the king, the consequences were quite severe. And uh, aren't you glad for the age of grace that we live in? Amen. Amen. So they didn't want people to misuse or abuse the privilege that had been given. So, so the king, when using or sending these emissaries or these messengers out, would find somebody that he was trusted implicitly. That makes sense, right? Everybody with me? So now he's got all power, all authority, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. Other versions correctly render this passage to read, all authority has been given unto me. The Amplified goes a little bit further. It says that uh, he has been given the power to rule or the power to command or the power to tell others what they should do. We go down to Matthew chapter 9, verse 5, and also Luke chapter 5, verse 24. Uh, we find an instance where Jesus, and it's interesting, no, I never noticed this before, but Jesus made his home in Capernaum. Did you all know that? The Bible talks about in, in the passage or the scripture that I was reading, and Jesus came home. So when they, when they brought this paralytic to him and his four friends brought him up onto the roof and lowered him down through the roof for Jesus to heal because there just wasn't any room for them to come through the door. And, and here Jesus is. He's teaching and he's at home and it's crowded and people are gathered in. He's done miracles. They're, they're, they're just astounded at all that he's done. And everybody wants to receive something, either teaching or a miracle or a sign or something. And these four men brought their friend up on the roof and they lowered him through. Now he is. He's laying there and he's right in front of Jesus. And it's obvious that he needs something, right? He needs to be healed, right? Now, Jesus says first words to this individual have absolutely nothing to do with healing his physical body. Jesus says these words. He says, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, immediately, everybody around him was up in arms. Because you see, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And, and, uh, and, and they're just... What on earth is going on here? Because only God can forgive sins. Well, they were right. And next thing Jesus says to them, he says, well, he said, tell me what's easier for me to say, thy sins be forgiven you, or rise up and walk. And so he says, but just to prove that I have the authority to forgive sins. Now, I want you to notice this. To prove that I have the authority to forgive sins, I will heal this man. And he turned to this paralytic and says to him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And the man immediately rose up and uh, picked up his bed and was healed and, and was strong. But Jesus qualified his authority by, you know, to forgive sins by doing this miracle and healing the paralytic. Authority was also not only... For Jesus, but he also passed on that authority to his disciples. In Mark chapter 3, verse 15, and chapter 6, verse 7, uh, he appoints the twelve and sends them out to preach. And then he said this, he says, I've given you authority to cast out devils and demons and unclean spirits. Now, we don't, we don't really recognize how they did it until later on when Jesus sent 72 out. And we find that passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And he sent 72 out two by two with kind of the same thing. They were to go into all the towns that Jesus was going to visit. And, and they were to prepare the way by preaching repentance and so forth. And, and they came back and they're just ecstatic. They're ecstatic because the devils are subject to them. They're ecstatic because they were able to do miracles and, and uh, they were able to heal others. And, and so they came back. 72 men, Jesus had sent them out. And they're just, man, we're just, 
look at this. The devils and the unclean spirits and the demons, they are subject to us. And now we have by what authority they were subject to the disciples. In your name. And so not only did Jesus have authority to, to be able to forgive sins and, and to heal others, but now he has passed this authority on to his disciples to be able to do the same thing in the name of Jesus. And of course, they, they did so. They went and they, uh, they healed others and they forgave sins. Now also, he is going to give this same authority to those of us that are in the church today. It is vitally important that we understand that there is power that is available to each and every one of you. There is power in the Holy Ghost, and we're going to preach on that next Sunday. But in the Spirit of God, there is power that you have available to you to be able to use in your life. But the question is, remember the seven sons of Sceva? They went and tried to cast the devil out. There's seven men. They'd seen Paul preaching, and, and so they said to this fellow that was demon-possessed, he says, uh, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, we adjure you to come out of him. Well, that demon-possessed man said, yeah, I'm sorry, not going to happen. Proceeded to beat on these seven guys. They fled naked and, and bleeding from that household because he just literally attacked them all and overcame seven different people. And uh, because they did not have the authority to be able to use that name. They understood that that was the name that Paul preached in, but they didn't have that authority that was given to them. I want you to know something today. God has made available to us power, but we have to have the authority of Jesus' name to be able to use it. And not only that, but God has made sure that, that we're recognizable as those that have been given the authority to use Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So he appointed the 12, then he appointed the 72, and uh, he, they rejoiced. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus has answered, don't rejoice because of this, but because your names are written. But this is no fine and dandy, but it doesn't really help us unless we understand that that power or that authority has been passed on to you and to me. It's fine for Peter to use it. It's fine for Paul to use it or James or one of the other disciples and, uh, and understand that Jesus gave him the authority to be able to do these things in his name. But all of that is of no effect unless we understand that, that we also have the authority in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, most of you will remember this passage of Scripture. I want you to notice that, that first of all, Jesus asked his disciples, uh, whom say, uh, men that I am, and they said, Jeremiah, Isaiah, one of the prophets, whom do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, jumped up, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he, at least by revelation, understood who Jesus was. And then Jesus talks to me. He says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. You see what Jesus is doing? He's giving to Peter and to those that would follow after Peter in the new church. He's giving them the authority to be able to bind things and be able to loose things. The fact is, if you notice this passage of Scripture, that he does so that, that Peter actually has the ability to bind something that is now going to be written in heaven, not vice versa. He is able to loose something that is now going to be loosed in heaven, not the other way around. In other words, what Peter was going to use and say and, and uh, do for the early church was exactly what was going to be written in heaven as being required and needed. Amen. And so uh, he said to you, I'm going to give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. John 20 verse 22 said this. Um, Jesus, again, after his ascension, or pardon me, after his uh, burial and resurrection, he's talking to his disciples and he says, these words, first of all, he goes to each one of his disciples and he breathes on them. And then he says, receive you the Holy Ghost. And then he says these words to them. If you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven them. Oh, we've got it up there. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So again, Jesus is giving the authority to His disciples and by virtue of that, also down to us in the church, that as we are able to look at others and we say, in Jesus' name, you're forgiven of your sins, then they will be forgiven them. That's, that's an awesome power, isn't it? Everybody said amen. Do you realize the authority that you have in the name of Jesus today? That when you pray, James understood this. We just finished going through the book of James when he said, If there any be sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. They shall anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord, and you shall be healed, and their sins will be forgiven them. That in the name of Jesus and the authority that God has given you and me through the church and down from Peter and, and all the others that began the church back then, that you have the ability in Jesus' name to be able to put, lay your hands on somebody, anoint them with oil, and pray for them. And the Bible says their sins will be forgiven them. It's pretty awesome, isn't it, Leroy? Isn't that awesome that God would in, invest that in each and every one of us and allow us to have that ability and uh, that power and authority within our lives? One more scripture reference, or actually there's a couple more scripture references I want to go to. We want to go back to our, our gentleman here in the book of Acts that we read about. And, and uh, we find that this lame man was there and he had been brought there every day of his life that he had been brought and laid down at the, at the gate beautiful on the steps there. And it was a law in Israel, or at least it was part of their, their rules and laws that they were supposed to give to the poor. And so this man was put in a very prominent position in order that he would be able to receive enough money to be able to live. And so he had some people that would bring him there. I kind of think that those that brought him there were being, they probably took a portion. There was probably carrying charges for carrying him there to the gate beautiful, right? We pay carrying charges nowadays, but I think probably they say, well, how much did you make today? And uh, probably a portion of that they would take. Uh, that's just my thought on it. Anyway, there he is at the gate beautiful, and Peter and Paul come, and, uh, and I want you to know that, that this is the very beginning. Now they're wondering, I would think, is this that we had back when this authority that was given, is this still going to continue because this is the first miracle of the new church? And here this man is. Now, just so you know, the Bible says that he was placed on the, on the steps how often? Every day. Every day he was brought there. Now, we see at least that three or four times that Jesus actually entered in through that temple. And so he had to have passed by this man in order to go into the temple, right? Right? And why didn't Jesus heal him? You know what? I think that he, he was looking ahead and he saw the time when, when Peter and John were going to go up there to pray and, and thought, I'm going to leave this one for them. And so that they would be able to come and, and uh, this man is begging and got their attention. And, and, uh, and so they stopped and they looked down on him and he's sitting there on the steps and, and he's not even looking at them. He's just maybe holding his cup up or, or just calling out alms and, and they stop. And he's got their attention. He asked them to look out on him. Or Peter and John asked this man to look on them. And, and so he looks up at them and he's hoping that he's going to receive some money. And Peter says, I don't have any money. Sorry, can't give you any. I don't have any on me. Can't do it. But in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, he didn't just leave it there, but he grabbed hold of his hands and began to lift him up on his feet. And as he did so, and as this man began to rise, the Bible says that strength began to come into his ankles and his legs, and, and he rose up, and, and not only was he able to walk, but the Bible says that he was running and leaping into the temple and just praising God and glorifying God as he entered the temple. Well, this didn't go over so well in the temple. And so... Uh, so they want to know, and they, they found out that it was Peter and John that had, had done this, and, and so now they ask the question, and uh, I'm going to read this in the Amplified for you so that you'll have a good understanding of what it looks like. Starting in verse 10 in the Amplified, it says, Let it be known and clearly understood by all of you 
and by all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you demanded to be crucified, and by the Romans as well, whom God raised from the dead, in this name, that is, by the authority and power of Jesus, this man stands before you in good health. This Jesus is a stone which was despised and rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. That's pretty good, isn't it? And so we know that it is only by the name of Jesus that that man stood before them whole. But not only that, but that his salvation and our salvation and every person's salvation during this dispensation is dependent upon the name of Jesus in their lives. Stand together as musicians come, shall we? Colossians 3.17 says this, said Paul understood this and so when he preached and wrote, he wrote words like this, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. James understood it for he talks about when you come for prayer and you get the anointing oil in the name of the Lord that you're going to be healed and your sins will be forgiven you. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 says this, God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. No wonder the early church only ever baptized in Jesus' name. They didn't change that till about uh, 320 A.D. when a Roman emperor decided he would try and uh, incorporate all the masses that believed in the multitude of gods that they changed that to Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Can I tell you today just emphatically and just so that we're clear on this, there is no authority in the titles Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The only authority that the early church has, the authority to be able to use the power that God has made available to us, the only authority that we have is in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we use that authority, I want you to know something. When you have sickness in your family, when you have sickness in those that are around you, you have the authority in Jesus' name to go and pray for them. Amen. Amen. And yes, I know sometimes people are healed and sometimes they're not. That's God's choice whether He does it or not. But the, the understanding that the authority that we have in the name of Jesus Christ today is such an awesome power that if we just kind of get a realization of it, what it will do for us, there is no spirit that can come against you that is not subject to the name of Jesus. You cannot get depressed and have a spirit of depression that is not sub, cannot be subject to the name of Jesus Christ in your life. You cannot have an addiction or a habit in your life that you want to be rid of that has a hold of your life that is not subject to you in the name of Jesus Christ because everything in heaven and in earth and under the earth is subject whenever the name of Jesus is invoked. Today in our lives, as we, there's times I think that, not maybe you haven't done this, but there's times that I have. Well, you just kind of go through your prayer and you say it in Jesus' name or you use that name. But the understanding that we are using the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that He has sealed us and given us that authority to be able to use His name should put in each one of us an awe every time that we say it. There should be a reverence that goes along with it. It shouldn't be just a casual, I'm going to, I'm going to use the king's name and, and, uh, and just in passing. I just, it concerns me with our world that that name is so misused so often. It's used in swear words. It's used in, in all forth, sorts of corruption and, and various things that go on in our world. But I want you to know that today that it is the church that has the authority to use that name. And we have that ability to be able to use that name in our lives. I don't know what it is that maybe you need in your life today, but I want you to know that there is no disease, there is no sickness right now that, that it cannot be subject to the name of Jesus. So maybe 
right now what we need to do is just take a few moments and and I'll open up this altar in a moment and we can come and pray and and uh, maybe there's things in your life right now that you need to bring under subjection to that name. God wants to do a work in all of us. He wants His church to be... I don't know if you've noticed the things that He's invested in in His church, but He wants His church to have power. He wants His church to be noticeable in this day and age, especially with all the things that are going on in our world right now. I want you to know we should shine brighter than we ever have. It is that name that's going to make a difference. Not only for our lives, but in the lives of those that are around us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to open up this altar. If you want to come and get prayer, I would invite you to come to this altar. And, and we'll do just like the Scripture says. We'll anoint you with oil and pray for you in Jesus' name. If you haven't had a move of the Holy Ghost in your life for a while, I want you to know in Jesus' name that you can have that move within your life. You can have that healing. You can have that deliverance in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This altar is open if you want to come and pray or if you want to pray where you're at in your pews right now. Just feel free to be able to, to reach out and be able to touch Him. This altar is open in Jesus' name.